Russian public has long been encouraged to view Crimea as native Russian land. This has led to widespread acceptance of the idea that the 2014 Russian invasion and annexation of Crimea was somehow justified as an act of historical justice. However, these claims do not match the reality of Crimean history. The 2014 annexation of Crimea was actually the fourth Russian attempt to claim the peninsula in the past 250 years. On each occasion, these efforts have ultimately failed. Many Russians are unaware that Crimea was never fully Russian. They also blindly believe that Sevastopol is a city of eternal Russian glory and regard any attempts to suggest otherwise as hostile acts of enemy propaganda. The Russian public is notoriously susceptible to the version of history presented by the country's media, but this does not change the historical reality of the situation. Vladimir Putin's attempts to compare the seizure of Crimea with Kosovo are a good example of these distortions. Yes, if it was acceptable in Kosovo for the Kosovo Albanians, if it was acceptable in many regions of the world, this is a people's right to self-determination, which is recognized by the United Nations. At first glance, Putin's talk of self-determination seems reasonable, but in reality the comparisons between Crimea and Kosovo are misleading. Before Kosovo voted for independence, the region was under UN control for nine years. In contrast, Crimea's referendum was held less than one month after the start of the Russian invasion, and with the peninsula under complete Russian military control. It is little wonder that the international community has refused to recognize the referendum, given that Putin himself Himself has admitted that the Russian army was deployed prior to the vote. While Russia has attempted to justify the seizure of Crimea by pointing to international laws of self-determination, the Kremlin still refuses to recognize Kosovo's independence, citing violations of international law. Apparently, in Putin's version of reality, the military seizure of Crimea does not constitute a breach of international law. Uh, um, uh, uh. Many Russians have short memories and are prone to believing everything they are shown on Kremlin-controlled TV. They have proved particularly susceptible to the myths that Crimea has always been Russian and that Sevastopol is a city of Russian glory. The historical evidence does not support the Kremlin's claims to Crimea. Many, both in Russia and internationally, have accepted the idea that Crimea was always Russian. But this is simply not true. Strictly speaking, Crimea was only part of the Russian imperial state for 135 years. This is far less than Ottoman Turkey, which controlled the Crimean Peninsula for 340 years. The Mongol Empire ruled in Crimea for 200 years, and the Byzantine Empire possessed the peninsula for more than 650 years. Crimea was part of Soviet Russia for 32 years. For the past 60 years, Crimea has been part of Ukraine. This historical data does not back up the Kremlin's claims. On the contrary, the facts speak for themselves. It is also worth looking at census data compiled by the Russian Empire itself. In 1897, about one and a half million people lived on the peninsula. According to Russian records, Ukrainians made up the largest ethnic group. At the end of the 19th century, the population of Crimea was only 27% Russian. That is about the same proportion of Russians as is found in today's Latvia. But we do not see anyone trying to claim that Latvia is Russian. Apologists for the Russian annexation of Crimea might well choose to ignore this data and instead argue that even if ethnic Russians were in a minority, Imperial Russia nevertheless brought cultural and economic progress to the Crimean Peninsula after its annexation at the end of the 18th century. Perhaps the best commentary on this argument was provided by the poet Maximilian Voloshin. This former paradise of Islamic culture has been completely destroyed. Instead of beautiful villages in the style of 1001 Nights, the Russians have built poor towns in the tradition of Potemkin and Catherine the Great and given them pseudo-classical names like Sevastopol, Simferopol and Yevpatoria. The ancient coastline from Balaclava to Alushta has been defaced with ugly villas built in the style of railway stations and brothels, while the hotels resemble imperial palaces. This museum of bad taste, which has pretensions to compete with Europe's most prestigious resorts, will remain the only monument to the era of Russian rule in Crimea.
The Russian public can shout Krim Nash or Crimea is ours as much as they like, but this will not make Crimea any more Russian. Nor will it change history and transform Sevastopol into a city of Russian glory. It may come as a surprise to some, but the so-called Russian glory of Sevastopol is closely tied to two Ukrainians who played key roles in the defense of the city during the Crimean War. Admiral Nakhimov and the celebrated sailor Pyotr Koshka. The popular hero Petro Markovich Koshka was born in the village of Ometinsi, near Vinitsia, to a family of Ukrainian peasants. The aristocratic Nakhimov family traced its roots back to Manuel Nakhimenko, captain of the Atirsky Ukrainian Cossack Regiment, whose ancestors lived for centuries in the Poltava region of Ukraine. According to Imperial Russian data, during the Crimean War, 70% of all Black Sea Fleet sailors were Ukrainian. These facts flatly contradict the myth of Crimea as part of Putin's so-called Russian world, but they can be easily verified by referring to publicly available archive information. Even the museums of Crimea itself serve to undermine the legend of Sevastopol as a city of singularly Russian glory. In the Sevastopol Museum, located at the site of the St. Michael's Artillery Battery, a photo on prominent display features Crimean War veterans who had served in the Black Sea Fleet during the conflict. The photo was taken in 1904 to mark the 50th anniversary of the defense of Sevastopol. Of the 41 men featured in the photo, 35 have Ukrainian family names. The other six men in the photo may also have hailed from Ukraine, given that the sailors of the Russian Imperial Fleet were generally recruited from the Ukrainian lands closest to Crimea. Given the prominent role played by ethnic Ukrainians in the Tsarist-era defense of Sevastopol, it becomes clear that the myth of the city's Russian glory is actually written in Ukrainian blood. If we are really interested in historical accuracy, it would technically be more appropriate to refer to Sevastopol as a city of Ukrainian glory. It is also worth pointing out that the Kremlin has little reason to take pride in the Crimean War, which the Russian Empire decisively lost. The Crimean War saw an alliance of European powers unite in order to counter Russian military aggression and imperial expansionism. In an eerie echo of today's Ukraine conflict, the Kremlin sparked the Crimean War while claiming to be defending the rights of its orthodox co-religionists. The Crimean War offers obvious parallels with modern Russia, but Putin seems content to ignore the lessons of history. Whenever Russia places itself in opposition to the developed world, Russia loses. This is exactly what we are currently witnessing and what millions of ordinary Russians are seeing with their own eyes, the slow but steady decline of the increasingly isolated Russian Federation. Sevastopol residents who seek comfort in the myths of Russian glory would be well advised to pay more attention to the street names of their city, which reflect the prominent role played by Ukrainians in this glory. The sailor Ivan Holubets, captain of the destroyer Bezopreshny, Brigadier Commissioner Petro Buryak, Mikhail Stepanenko, company commander Dmitry Zagorulka, and a whole host of other Ukrainians who became heroes of Sevastopol during the Second World War. Naturally, there are numerous Sevastopol streets named in honor of Russian heroes, but the city also commemorates Belarusians, Armenians, Georgians, Jewish, and Tatar heroes. The Ukrainian role in the Crimean conflicts of the 19th and 20th centuries has been hugely significant and has cost Ukraine thousands of its best sons. Russian nationalists can shout about the Russian glory of Sevastopol all they like, but the fact remains that if anything, it is a city built to a large extent on Ukrainian heroism. Another myth popular amongst the Russian public is the claim that Crimea was gifted to Soviet Ukraine by Nikita Khrushchev while he was drunk. Russians have grown used to hearing stories about Khrushchev's senseless and emotional decision to gift Crimea to Ukraine. In reality, Khrushchev's decision was both sober and logical. It was legally backed by the necessary decrees signed by the Soviet leadership, including Voroshilov. The formal justification for the decision was clearly stated in the accompanying Soviet documentation, which cites the economic affinity, geographical proximity, administrative and cultural ties linking Crimea with Ukraine. The decision to integrate Crimea with Soviet Ukraine was clearly a sensible one, not least because so little had been done to develop Crimea while it was under Soviet Russian administration.
While administered by Soviet Russia, Crimea had been prone to drought and famine. There was very little agriculture on the peninsula. Crimea was not just a depressed region, it was a virtual desert. The transfer of Crimea to Ukrainian control proved in many ways to be the salvation of the peninsula. Within a few years of the 1950s transfer, water from the Dnipro River was flowing to Crimea by a newly constructed 400-kilometer canal, allowing for the irrigation of 180,000 hectares of land. The production of electricity was boosted, as was iron ore extraction. Wine production doubled. New techniques in rice farming and industrial fishing were introduced. Modern transport and tanker fleets were established. Once it became part of Soviet Ukraine, Crimea became an agricultural and industrial success story. Soviet Russia had achieved none of this during 32 years of administering Crimea. Moscow failed to invest in Crimea while in direct control of the peninsula during the first half of the 20th century, so there are perhaps good reasons to expect the current Russian occupation to be similarly underwhelming. Regardless of your personal political sympathies, it is difficult to find any factual basis for the claims that the Russian annexation of Crimea represents historical justice. The notion that Crimea has always been Russian is a fairy tale which ignores millennia of diverse Crimean history. Russian propaganda has built a myth around Crimea in order to justify an aggressive foreign policy of unprovoked expansionism and annexation. Will the Kremlin attempt to employ the same historical arguments in order to reclaim Alaska? It is unlikely. The Kremlin seems to be more comfortable bullying weaker and smaller neighbors while fabricating history in order to justify its aggression. Fantasies of Russian historical greatness may simply be all Putin has left to offer his citizens. It is a backward-looking worldview which is at odds with the globalized 21st century world. If Russia wants to live in the real world, it will have to recognize that Crimea has not always been Russian and is not Russian today.